Welcome one and all to Last Stop Penn Station podcast featuring Carrie Silken and Ian Riccoboni. They dive deep into Carrie's wealth of stories and no subject is off limits. From the world of wrestling to his ticket agency, growing up in New Jersey, drug-fueled underground days, hustling in the French Quarter of New Orleans, and endless days and nights in New York City, every story is worth telling. Hey, welcome everyone. It is season two, episode four of Last Stop Penn Station. I'm Ian Riccoboni, and I'm joined by our guest of honor, Carrie Silk. And Carrie, it's been a while. Good to see you, my <laughs> friend. How are you? Uh, oh, I'm well, Carrie, but I, I messed up. <laughs> uh, took the family to Florida right as uh, things weren't going so well down there. But we made it out. It's been two weeks since we've been down there. No symptoms, no nothing. And so I think we made it out okay. We saw my brother and our new nephew. Good. And your parents. And our parents, yeah. And we're, at, we're apparently out, uh, the way you describe it, I picture them like being in the middle of Alligator Alley. <laughs> yes. <laughs> we see, I've seen some gators down there. It's uh, beautiful Fort McCoy, Florida, which yeah, uh, yeah. near John, near where John Travolta lives, believe it or not, and uh, Dory Funk Jr. So... It's an area where uh, you know, my parents have, they call it the Swamp Shack. It's in the middle of a swamp in the middle of the forest. But, uh, but yeah, it's fun. You get to clear your mind. The kids had fun hunting for lizards. Well, I'm glad you had a chance to uh, just take a little vacation. And uh, last stop, Penn Station has been on vacation. It's okay, <laughs> though. Uh, no big deal. But we're, we're, we're happy to be back. And uh, we got a good response uh, from the... Uh, not only from the Larry Sweeney episode, but the Sammy Stewart episode. And then the ticket hustling episode that we did last of poor Helen Economou <laughs> and poor <laughs> E. Girk. E. Girk. Oh, poor guy. Yeah, the, uh, the South Dakota, right? It was, uh, it was in North Dakota. Excuse he, me. I think it was leaving from Fargo. <laughs> Fargo, that's North Dakota, yeah. Damn. Oh, man. I know. What a trip. <laughs> Poor McGuire. All, you... that, all that way for that man to go on the Roman holiday. Oh, jeez. <laughs> his oh. teenage daughter in the Can you imagine that? To be that composed? Oh. I mean, in this day and age, I, I would have... Well, I but, can't even say what I would have done had, had I found that out. But... Anyhow, we have a lot to talk about. Baseball is back, or is almost back. Hopefully. Hopefully. Fingers crossed. And basketball is coming back soon. Well, all the sports seem to be coming back, yet we uh, try not to watch too much news. Yeah. It messes with my head. Yeah. But uh, when I do see the news and concerning sports, it's always, well, there's a one team reported a COVID case, and then... I might have the teams wrong, but I believe the Washington Nationals and the Houston Astros baseball teams had to close down their uh, training facilities mm -hmm. uh, for a day or so. So hopefully we'll see some baseball back. Hopefully we'll see some of these other sports back. Um, so, some sports... Uh, the, the Ivy, not that it's such a major thing, but in a way it is. Ivy League football, mm -hmm. they threw in the towel. And the Patriot League, too. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, it's a tough year. It's a tough time. So if we could give you a little entertainment here, <laughs> a, dis a distraction on Last Stop Penn Station, uh, that's what we want to do. Telling you some, tell, telling you some odd stories and... Uh, we appreciate the feedback and uh, please subscribe at whatever plat podcast platform you listen to the, us on. Yeah. And uh, Carrie, when we were preparing for today's episode, you sent me one word or uh, I guess two words, <laughs> glob ball. And that's all you said. And uh, you said you had a good one. You've been working on the book Last Stop Penn Station with, with, uh, with Mike G. Yeah. And this sprung to mind. Right. And 
<laughs> and, and you've just you've been grinning and laughing ear to ear since, since I walked in the well, door. <laughs> you know, my cousin, uh, the, the, similar to how we do this, the uh, the book is just being done not in a linear, if that's the correct word, but not in a, co a complete timeline fashion. So there's parts about my ticket scalping and Penn Station era. There's parts about naturally about Ring of Honor and my uh, pro wrestling uh, stories, the New Orleans stuff, the the various characters and and, and stuff of and then we've touched on a few of these um, and stuff of my origins, you know, as a kid uh, and growing up in Cranford, New Jersey. And so I was talking to Mike earlier this week and what he had written about some of the formative stuff of, of me. And I said, I said, there's a lot of stuff left out. I go, you, you know, <laughs> he, he goes, oh, people want to hear about Ring of Honor. And I said, I know, but um, I had recently read, not uh, over the last few months, um, a, Leonard Cohen, or a Leonard Cohen biography, Robbie Robertson from the band, mm -hmm. uh, <clears throat> autobiography, and... I am not on the level of Leonard Cohen or Robbie <laughs> Robertson, but they always talk a lot about, you know, their childhood in any biography you read, you know, you want to get to, you know, if it's your rock and roll hero or if it's a sports hero, uh, you want to get to the, you know, the, you know, your favorite baseball player, you know, you want to get to that, you know, read about Mike Schmidt. Well, you know, it, it, some people don't want to hear about him growing up. Some of you, but these stories are entertaining. So I had to throw in some stuff from, from uh, with Mike. And we were talking about me going to high school uh, and in Cranford. And some really odd stuff came up, uh, including the glob ball. <laughs> <laughs> well, before we get to that, <laughs> which, again, Carrie has been smiling ear to ear giggling ready to ready to unleash this how would you describe yourself in high school were you a uh, jock nerd uh, kept yourself friends well <clears throat> Cranford High School had an odd uh, most I, I believe most I don't know about you you guys could uh, you know AJ our producers here we had you know six grades first grade through sixth grade was grammar school Mm -hmm. But then our junior high school was grades seven through ten. Oh, right. And Cranford was divided by a railroad track, which was almost made a dead even north and south. So I was a south side kid and the north side was maybe a little bit more affluent, but not much. And uh, so the. Um, we had this four with this four year junior high. So the people that you eventually got together with in high school, which was a lot of other kids, you really didn't get to meet until that era, you mm -hmm. know, the, the last couple of years. So to answer your question, um, I was I was a good I was an OK student and I was an OK athlete. But in junior high, um, somehow I lost my academic drive. Mm. Now, this is pre-drugs, even even marijuana. My marijuana use didn't start till I was like eh, maybe 16. So but for some reason, I would gravitate to I, I didn't give a damn about I started I started not caring about my grades that much. Mm. And I grad, I gravitated. I had good friends, and they were good guys. But I guess due to my not so great scholastic ability, you know how they would put you in classes based. <laughs> sure, yeah. Uh, you were probably in a top <laughs> level. Both you guys, uh. we, were, we were probably in top level. But um, you know, so I didn't, I had by the time I was in ninth and tenth grade, and once again I wasn't using. I got mixed in with these classes with these kids that, you know, were really off the wall and some troublemakers. And it was sort of uh, fun kind of trouble. But some of it was 
sort of mean. Mm. You know, there's a mean spirited, you yeah. know, kids, kids pick on each other. Um, so the glob ball. <laughs> <laughs> fast, must, fast track to the glob ball <laughs> it must have been ninth grade ninth or tenth grade and this is 72 oh, three yeah and yeah yeah and uh 71 maybe and okay. uh i had this english teacher miss cop k-o-p-p mm. nice little old lady well there was nothing wrong with her but there was a lot of <laughs> There were a lot, a lot of kids in the class were messed up. The great Bill Wilderbeast, Bill Willoughby, the, I went under the name of the Wilderbeast, Charlie Semple, John Mingoya. These kids were just, you know, they just now and I, I wasn't a leader. I was a follower. So Miss Cop was a nice little old lady trying to teach us ninth or tenth grade English. And uh, the wildebeest, <laughs> he had this brilliant idea. Now, you two guys are probably both too young to remember this. Do you remember the classic yellow lined piece of the pad? The, the, sure, like the legal pad? Yes. Yeah. You remember that? <laughs> well, Bill Willoughby, <laughs> how he... <laughs> how he decided or, or, or thought this was a good idea <laughs> he would take a complete full page it was pretty thick <laughs> you know they weren't like paper thin slices and he would crunch it up now I have a piece of paper here in front of me it would have be this is about this is about what it was. Oh wow, yeah, that's right. And he would cardstock cr right. almost, yeah. He would crunch it up <laughs> and shove it in his mouth. Oh god. Why would he do that? And he'd start chewing. And chewing. In the middle of class. And chewing wait. It wasn't it. There was an end game to it. Oh. So <laughs> <laughs> Miss Cop, at whatever point, she would be like, you know, she, she'd be teaching us something about uh, Hemingway. <laughs> and, and, what's a great Hemingway novel? Moby Dick, <laughs> right? She turned around and, what of Hemingway's great novels? And she'd turn around to the blackboard, thus... <laughs> dust with her back completely turned and at which point the wildebeest had now gnawed this thing into this disgusting oh. and he took it out of his mouth <laughs> no he did not throw it at her Okay. But he threw oh. it at the blackboard. Oh, it's even worse. <laughs> it just, oh, it just, was like, it was, it was literal like paper mache. Oh. And it, it stopped. Well, <laughs> the wildebeest was in <laughs> He was in <laughs> He was a trendsetter. No, no. Other kids... Including wow. myself, um, <laughs> would start chewing the Why? <laughs> <What? laughs> so, give me another Hemingway novel. Oh, geez, I, I'm blind. I, my, my mind is, yeah. <laughs> uh, and so, when she turned around, she goes, and the main character of Moby Dick, and she very <laughs> captain, whatever his name is. Captain A. Yeah. 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 <laughs> and all of a sudden, bop, 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 bop. <laughs> Six oh. of these glob balls. But here's the thing. And I, I, you know, I felt bad for this woman. And she, she was used to this. Oh. You know, she just, she's like. She soldiered on. She soldiered on. <laughs> Eventually, she's like, would you stop? Would you stop? You know, this is my grade. She said, will you stop throwing the goddamn thing? <laughs> but here's the thing. It was disgusting. <laughs> but the thing that really um, 
amazed me <laughs> was when you would go back to class. Now, don't forget this is just one period. Right. <laughs> so other teachers and other classes oh. would be in there. When you would go back to class... The next day, the next day, the next day, the glob balls were still oh. with it. They were still remaining. No one's cleaning the board? No one's Why? cleaning the board. <laughs> and there was little, less and less room to write on oh, it. Oh, no. Right. Oh, this last stop, Penn Station, the only place you could learn <laughs> about the glob ball. While I'm on, while I'm on uh, early <laughs> days of Cranford and we're talking about people I think I might have mentioned him in an earlier podcast, but um, if I did, so be it. I don't think. Did I ever tell you about the great C. C. Harris? No, you you've mentioned him to me, but you've never told me the story right. or mentioned him on the C. C. Harris. First of all, he was a wrestling fan. Oh, okay. Second of all, he was the primary place in Cranford to obtain wrestling magazines. Really? Yeah. There was a number of newsstands, cigarette. Uh, you know, candy stores. Uh, and some of them didn't carry a lot. I remember finding my first wrestling magazine at Jackson's. That's where I would walk back from high school. Mm -hmm. And I found a wrestling magazine. It's like, wow. And uh, I asked my father for whatever it was, might have been 25 cents. Mm -hmm. And uh, so then I would go into Cranford. Now, this is an era when you were 10, 11, 12 years old. You could just walk around town, mm. you know, uh, it's unfortunate for a lot of kids and it's just different times. Mm -hmm. But back then you could just walk around town. So I would scour the stores <clears throat> and there was a, <laughs> which, which now reminds me of old lady Morgan Roth. <laughs> 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 she was probably in her mid forties. <laughs> oh, we yeah. called her old lady Morgan Roth. She had, she had, you know, you guys are a little too young. You know, the classic soda fountain. Okay. You know, they sold cigarettes, newspapers, magazines, and there was a counter. Mm -hmm. You could get soda. You might be able to get breakfast or a hamburger. Mm -hmm. And old lady Morgan Roth, she was like a chain smoker, <clears throat> and she didn't have a lot of titles. And we used to mess around with her. And we'd go in there and we'd make up names of magazines. <laughs> and we'd be like, ooh, do you have the latest copy of Auto Zoom World? <laughs> and she'd be like, pff, pff, hold on. And then she'd go into like the, the section that had, you know, the auto. <laughs> what, what was the title? <laughs> you know, and we, 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 you know, we would torture the poor woman. But... <laughs> so she she had some wrestling titles, but we eventually when I when I got to know, uh, I always knew C. C. Harris's was there. It was the strangest store, because and I might have told A. J. this story, because if right now and if you're watching this on YouTube and I suggest you do, because <clears throat> we post these if you want to see us live, <laughs> if they put a wall. Uh, sort of over your shoulder. Okay. And they put a wall sort of over my shoulder. Mm -hmm. And this is the front of the store. Okay. It was a triangle, right? Oh. Like this. That was the whole store. And th th here was the thing. CC was a short, stout man about, I don't know, five foot five and probably about 350 pounds. So he's the owner and the name, the namesake is the owner and the person's the store. It's like bad companies, bad company out. Correct. Bad company on. Okay. And the store was so little and his specialty, well, he sold, you know, it was probably made his money with tobacco mm -hmm. and he had magazines, you know, like I said, the wrestling magazines and he had, ooh, you know, we knew, we knew that he had like the Playboy magazines and uh, this is like in the days when Penthouse was first coming out, oh. right? Um, and I, the store was, oh yeah, here this is the thing. The store was so little mm -hmm. that he didn't keep them behind the counter. Oh. Right. Oh, now, yeah. <laughs> behind, now, it, the official name was not C.C. Harris. The official <laughs> name was, was uh, the Penny Shop. Huh. And the reason was, and this is, we're talking like, when, when I was even in grammar, you know, like, 11, 10, 11, 12, 13, 
uh, he had penny candies behind him. So here's Cece. You so would walk. Good. The nudie magazines are out, free for anybody to look at, but the candy's the protected goods here. Well, the, they had <laughs> these candies that were in jars. Oh, okay. You know, like these giant these uh, licorice sticks. And they these they kind of do that at the airports now and the malls. Yeah, right. The malls, yeah. So then I think he had the cigarettes back there. But then in front was the candies and the newspapers and stacks of magazines. He had a rack mm -hmm. of magazines, but he had a much better selection than old lady Morgan Roth. <laughs> and he had, the, so he would have stacks of magazines. So many so that he would have some outside. Wow. And he had a little, a little awning sort of protecting them in case it rained. And so when we used to go to the movie theater, and once again, I wasn't really a, I, I was a follower and I wasn't a big troublemaker. But when we go to the movie theater, um, one of my friends says, you know, yeah, let's go there. And we'll ask, you know, because back then the movie was like maybe I'm talking like 1969, 19, the movie was maybe a, a dime. Wow. And, you know, my father would give me a quarter that was enough to buy, you know, candy. And uh, but you go to C.C. Harris's. Right. So I would go there and one of my friends would say, we be like five of us. Hey, Cece, we got one of those. Can I get one of those giant purple jawbreakers? Now, of course, and once again, he was five foot five, 350 pounds. Yeah. Of course, that's the one that is on the top oh. that he's got to stand up. Oh, and turn around. So <laughs> when he's doing that, we're grabbing, we're grabbing, we're grabbing Milky Way bars. Oh no, we're grabbing three Carrie, you tears. Help we're the statute of limitations is up yeah, on it. We're great, you know. And um, then we'd like, hey, cease. Then he would turn around and go, one cent, please. Oh no. <laughs> <laughs> Could we have a lime giant licorice stick? And. Uh, same thing would happen. We wouldn't always do this. We did it a couple times. Uh, eventually, I learned to like CC. I found, I mean, not that I, 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 once again, I was a follower, but um, there was this one kid, Mitch, and uh, they had this, uh, <laughs> <laughs> they used to do these things, um, like the day, like a, a Planet of the Apes. They're showing like four of them. Oh, okay. Or whatever. Day of Horror. You know, sure. I think there wasn't enough Planet of the Apes. <laughs> Not yet, Day but of yeah. Horror. <laughs> and in this case, Mitch, who, who was a little bit rowdy, he had, I don't know where he got the money, but he's like, says this is <laughs> Give me 50, 50 of the giant jawbreakers. Now, I don't know if they still make. You ever see those giant sweet tarts? Yeah. I don't know how people eat those no. without their teeth <laughs> falling out. These jawbreakers were like literal jawbreakers. Well, Mitch wanted to buy them because you could use them. <laughs> we're going to the movies. Mm -hmm. You could you could use them to um, throw it. This, <laughs> this is back in the days of one screen normal theater, and this thing was so heavy. <laughs> It's like a baseball. <laughs> you throw the screen you're like oh, this. Oh, they would wobble and so, yeah. right. And there was this. There was this guy who was like a. a <laughs> it was a so-called usher, and he was more of a cleanup guy. And I don't know. He we we always used to say uh, the kids would 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 make fun of him and, and say uh, oh. You know, the, the guy was shell shocked, mm. right? Nah. <laughs> and Mitch and the wildebeest had this plan. They're going to get this guy. No. They wanted, they wanted to, they just wanted to mess with him. Oh, so, no. so when they had a, 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 an abundant amount of these jawbreakers, and they had the thought that when the guy, and we're at the Saturday matinee, <laughs> it's all kids. Right, the parents drop the kids off. There's, you know, there was probably a few adults, but when the guy was coming up the aisle, sort of cleaning, Wilderbeast thought 
if he releases, like it's a cartoon, if he releases 20 of these giant jawbreakers, the guy's going to go fly in, right? Well, when it didn't happen, uh, his friend Charlie Semple, who was held back and just tackled him. He just did a lot of like 12 year old boys, right? You know, the guy, the guy sort of pushed him off. And off, and, and off we went. But that, yeah, so I have, so I used, so I struck up a rapport with Cece. Um, he had all the magazines and he used to like to talk wrestling. Oh, okay. So, yeah. And, so he'd be, he'd be like, and he, you know, he, he, he was a believer. Yeah. And he'd be like, yeah, Monsoon, he's never going to beat Bruno. You know, you know they're going to have that Texas death match. Bruno's going to probably pin him within, you know, 15 minutes. But I'm like, yeah, but CC, last time they had a one hour draw. <laughs> right. So he, we would discuss wrestling logic, uh-huh. you know, with my 10, 11, 12 year old self. And, um, CC was very smart, or he thought he was. Um, I was in there one time, and there had been a fire. There was like one of these <laughs> fortune tellers in town, like you know, Madame Glenda, well, you know, tarot card. Really, I mean, I I used to hear about it in the Bruce Springsteen songs, but those were a, those were a thing. I that, think they even have some around yeah, here. I, that's yeah. You know, they. Uh, yeah. Tara, Ouija boards, Tara. Anyway, there yeah. was one in Cranford. It was a block or two from CC's. And the building had caught on fire. Nothing really happened. Oh. And so, so CC Harris says to me about the fortune, Madam Glenda, he goes, what the hell's wrong with the woman? If she could read the future, why didn't she know the place was going to burn up? <laughs> so, so that's a little tale about the great CC Harris. <laughs> um so yeah, um, in my going ahead a few years, in in my high school, in, before we were on the air, we were talking about this. There was that period of time when you were 16, 17, even 18, where there was really nowhere to go, you know, on an event, particularly on New Year's Eve. That was a big night. Mm. At least it was for me. And I remember having a terrible New Year's Eve. Uh, I must have been like in 11th grade and I had a girlfriend and um, we had nowhere to go. And uh, one of the kids, one of our friends says, oh, you could come in over, you know, to my, my mother said we could be in the basement. You know, we got someone to buy us some beer and we probably had some weed. And we did have weed. And uh, I remember getting very depressed, even almost breaking out crying. Mm. So I'm like, this is New Year's Eve. Mm. And we're, <laughs> we're in this, you know, what am I expected to be in the Ritz Carlton <laughs> with, the, with the ball dropping? So the next year came. Now, my dad, as we've discussed in previous episodes, he was a bartender, fill him up, Phil. And he worked at the Cove, which was a, a hip place with good jazz music. And my mom didn't go there very often. Because that was his his gig, and uh, she would go once in a blue moon. But this New Year's Eve, she was going to go to the Cove and hang out. And uh, my mother, she was she was small, and she used to like to have a few drinks, but she couldn't drink too much. Mm-hmm. And um, she was going to pay the plan was she was going to pace herself, and they're going to do the New Year's thing. And then, you know, go out for, uh, they would go out to the diner afterwards. Mm-hmm. Off to my father and his friends in the band. Um, it was a really good band, Morris Nant and Trio. It was an unforgot, it was an un, this guy could have been like right up there with the greats, but he just, just and he, was, he, was, he, was, he was a teacher hmm. and he just decided uh, he had, uh, you know, just guitar, bass, and drums. And they were good because I'd went, I had, I'd seen them also. But anyway, this particular New Year's, it was, I guess the New Year's of 74, I knew my mother and fa- my father's working. Mm-hmm. My mother's going. Oh. Now <laughs> we have a place to go. Yeah. And, but I got to be careful. Mm-hmm. And they warned me. Look, my father was, you know, I'm, I'm, he was the, the voice of authority, you know. And uh, he goes, look. 
he he had already uh, found me with beer and, and weed and I was would give the always telling him it's like it's not mine <laughs> he'd be like yeah because he's been around you know working with you know he'd been in the bar business his whole uh, most of his adult life so he'd seen it all right he'd seen it all and he uh, anyway so he says to me look you know that me don't be doing nothing at the house you know just don't be done I'm like oh no 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 so <laughs> so I have an elite group of my friends, so I thought, mm -hmm. and we're able to, you know, procure, it was very easy to procure, the drinking age was 18, and most of us were not 18, but it was very easy to procure beer uh, through other guys, through people. And the word got out about my party. Oh, So no. now... I don't know if you've ever experienced this. You see the high school party where there's like a hundred kids there. Yeah. Well, there wasn't a hundred. Or even with wrestling, somebody says, "Hey, hey, Carrie, why don't you come to us? Come with us and eat afterwards." And right. then every tell a friend, tell a, yeah, tell yeah, a friend, tell a wrestler, yeah. And the poor guy gets stuck with the bill. But yes. <laughs> <laughs> or you go to Jimmy's Seafood and hope they you don't have to pay. Right. Thank you, thank you, Jimmy. <laughs> they, they've been very, very good. nice people. Thank you, John. <laughs> yes, absolutely. Um, but, um, so I had, so this party happens. Well, there's more people there than I expect there to be. Mm. And, and I, and some of them I didn't want there. Are we talking and, 10 people, 20 people? Well, there might've been 12 to 16 okay. desirables, mm. including like my good friends, like Gary Fennell and, uh, Dale Sabora and Gary's brother, Nick, and uh, Joe Aaron's, uh, and Mike Price, and these guys that were good friends of mine. But the word got out. Oh. And, you know, we, we, you know, people are knocking on the door, and uh, there was just too many people there. Yeah. And uh, there's a knock on the door at about like 10, 11 o'clock, and there was this kid. This is one kid, Mark Rolla Lapola. <laughs> okay. <laughs> His name was La Lapola, but he was sort of round, so he got the nickname Rolla Lapola. Oh. And he was angry that I didn't invite him. So when I opened the door, I'm like, look, dude, he, he, he punched me, right? Wow. He punched, yeah, he punched me. Did, yeah, he didn't hurt me. And then he just turns around and leaves. And I, <laughs> well, thanks for giving that mean nickname. You guys, I didn't give it like, to him. Y'all were mean. So, <laughs> you weren't mean. Anyway, so we're there. And the party's, the party's uh, in full swing. Now, I knew there was the possibility that I knew the bar was open until 2 in the morning. Mm -hmm. But I knew there's the possibility that my mom might... Uh, not decide not to stay. Sure. And my father gets gets her a ride back, or she could take a cab. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, they certainly, or the bar might close at two, and they don't go to the diner; they just go home. Sure. So, at about after the ball dropped, and it was about twelve thirty. Now, I, do they they used to televise that even back oh, yeah. then, right? Okay. Oh yeah. Yeah. So, and I, I told them, you know, now I had. Whatever, 20, 30, 24, 30 people, whatever. And wow. I'm like, look, at 1230, everybody's got to go. And I had my good friends that were going to help me clean up. Mm -hmm. And, you know, make everything was going to be spick and span. There is not yep. going to be one sign of anything going on at all. Zero. So Gary Fennell, Dale Sabora and Joe Aaron's were three good people to help me. And we get everyone out of the house and... By about one in the morning, I'm like, we, we, we inspected everything. Yeah. And it, it was clean as a whistle. Wow. Okay. Right. Yeah. So I say goodnight to Gary and to Dale and to Joe Aaron's. And uh, I went upstairs and I crashed. Well, the next morning, my door opens and it's my father. Mm -hmm. And it's probably about nine in the morning. He's like, what the hell is wrong with you? I'm like, I go happy. I go, happy. I go whoa, what are you talking about? Happy New Year. <laughs> yeah. Don't give me that Happy New Year shit. He goes, if your mother would have seen what I saw, Jesus Christ, what's going on? 
I'm like, what are you talking about? And he, and he well, what happened was <laughs> in their bedroom was a used, not for me, from someone. A raincoat. <laughs> yes, it was a used condom oh, no. that was on the floor. Oh, no. In their bedroom. Oh. And wait, then I thought I cleaned everything perfectly, but in the refrigerator, there was a bottle of blackberry brandy that might have went behind a, a carton of milk mm. and a couple of beers, you know, that were on the side of the couch, yeah. you know. And, you know, the cleaning wasn't as thorough as we thought. And But but my father was able to st- dispose of all this stuff. He, you know, before my mother, he, goes, he says, if your mother were to see you, Jesus Christ, what the hell is wrong with you? God damn it. I'm like, look, I just had a couple people, a couple people over, people, you know, having <laughs> sex in my bedroom. <laughs> oh my <God. laughs> you know, so he, he mellowed out. And my mother got up. And my father was always, he's, he's, he's like, you want some breakfast? And I'm like, yeah, sure. And he was, he was, he was, he was a good cook in general. And uh, he would, he would, he would make like ham and eggs, you know, like, mm-hmm. and uh, he's making the breakfast. And um, my, my, um, my father says, as we're doing it, my father says to me, Take out the, do me a favor, take out the garbage. Now, you're talking about the kitchen trash and the garbage cans were in the backyard. Okay. I'm like, oh, as soon as, yeah, well, you know, you, you know, it's, it's like, I, I would have taken it, you know, but he wanted me to take it immediately. Why should I say to him, don't take it? I'm, I'm like, I, I go, well, I was, I, I still, let me, as soon as I'm done eating, he goes, ah, Jesus Christ. Well, he takes the garbage. He's the, ah, I'll, I'll take it myself. He takes the garbage uh, out of the garbage can and he didn't get excited too much. <laughs> and he opens the back door and I hear him go, what the hell? And it was Joe Aaron's laying what? prone on a, uh, you know, like a lounge chair left oh, over God. from the summer. Now, this is January 1st. Right, morning. in Jersey. Right. <laughs> And literally, literally frozen stiff. Oh my god! And he helped you clean up. There's no. I reason. know. <laughs> I know. He didn't tell. I don't know how. He didn't tell me I need somewhere to stay. He didn't tell me nothing. There was Joe Aaron's. Oh. And my father. <laughs> then my mother sees this, and uh, Joe Aaron's woke up, and uh, ran away. <laughs> and <laughs> that was uh, a little tale. See, and you know what? I was thinking about this um, before we, uh, before I saw you guys. What, like, could any of these stories happen now with social media and texting? Yeah. And this, I mean, it's a different time, I, you know, living in the past and all this, but you know, there was no communication. It, it was just like, you know, roll the pole and might have texted me. Can I come over, dude? Yeah. And I'd been like, oh, okay. Or, or, or did some weird passive aggressive social right, media thing. Right. Yeah. Right. And so none of this, uh, none of this would have happened. But uh, those are uh, those are some interesting stories. Um of my early Cranford era, uh, that was that was the year that I graduated, and uh, I never had any more big parties at the house. <laughs> what kind of music did you guys listen to that night? Oh, that night or, or around <laughs> around then? Zeppelin and Floyd. You know, you had your you had your in Cranford. Or the, the the kids that I hung out with, you had your distinct group of like of the rock and roll types like Zeppelin, Floyd, Alice Cooper, and then the, some of the, you know, the, the prog, you know, the, you know, to get into bands like Yes and King Crimson and Jethro Tull, you know, you, it was more of a thinking thing, but, but we liked that. Uh, and then you had your other group of kids that like gravitated to like the Grateful Dead. Okay. You know, this is like pre Springsteen. Yeah. Uh, and gravitated to the dead. Um, and 
the Allman Brothers mm -hmm. and all the uh, the band and and the uh, the country countryish rock bands. I thought you were going to say country Joe and the fish. Well, them too. Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, but yeah, yeah. But we we definitely were into, into into listening to music. You know, that was a great era with FM radio. Yeah. Free form. Yeah. Which, you know, I listen to Serious View. I do. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, between that and uh, they had the Deep Cut Station for a long time on, on Channel 27. That I, used to I like that. They used to play a lot of 10 years after. Uh -huh. of, yeah. It's uh, a crack the sky, another great prog band, <laughs> right? And they would play, and, and they would they would play like themes, mm -hmm. uh, uh, songs that have the word uh, travel in it, yeah. or something of that nature. You know, traveling band by Creedence, and then another. Uh, you know, um, is there is that a Zeppelin song? Oh no, that, it's not travel on. What's the Zeppelin song? On? Ramble on. Ramble on. Yeah. I don't know. But, they, but you get the picture. But yeah. yeah, they would do that, you know, or they would play, you know, uh, the, the whole dark side of the moon straight yeah. through. And uh, yeah, it was a good time for music, and it was a good time for that era. Um, let's let's tie back to wrestling. Um, what kind of TV? Well, what kind of TVs were? Uh, or did your parents have? Were they the big cabinets? Well, they had the big cabinet. Do they have color yet? Yes. And I had my TV upstairs. Oh, that's, that's with kind the, of a rarity. Yes, they were very nice. And with the little, I know you guys don't know this, the little round UHF antenna. Okay, I've seen them. And you would have to, you know, <laughs> I would try to get these, uh, you know, particularly the only UHF I would watch because it was wrestling on. Oh, okay. And they started showing the, the uh, and I know we've referenced this before, but mm -hmm. we'll reference it again. They started showing the wrestling from Florida uh -huh. on Channel 47 on Tuesday nights at 11 o'clock. And then they started showing two hours of wrestling from the Olympic Auditorium in Spanish. Oh, wow. On Wednesdays. Mm -hmm. Uh on Channel 41. That's L.A., right? Yes. And uh, thus, since they were showing these two, they had a relationship with Vince McMahon Sr., mm -hmm. they would bring in these stars just like uh, to the garden. Yeah. You know, like so one month, uh, let's say Eddie Graham might come mm -hmm. or uh, Dusty Rhodes. Dusty Rhodes would come or, you know, from L.A., they would bring in uh, Gordon and Goliath okay. and just these odd stars. So, yeah, um, but you had to fight. You had to fight <laughs> to get these things in. I remember trying to get Philly, you know, oh, the, yeah. the Philly station. Sure. No, I'd be happy just listening. Yeah. Well, that, was, that was a thing. I mean, you used to be able to get the pay channels just to listen. Right. Yeah, so um, in that time, did you have the uh, the original Madison Square Garden channel yet? I know that no, launched. No, in, no. Um, I actually turned into USA at one point. HBO USA and the original Madison Square Garden channel. I know there's relationship there. They used to show all the. Yeah. The and I events. remember you used to go to this. We used to go to this bar in Elizabeth, New Jersey. Oh, the home of the great Jay Lethal. Right. Yeah. Uh, to watch. I mean, this is the earliest days of cable. Yeah. We're to uh, <clears throat> But I was often at the shows live. Mm -hmm. So it really didn't matter. Wow. But um, let's wrap up this episode. Sure. I, I'm going to. Uh, I've got another uh, interesting tale uh, about a, a, a road trip that's going to follow this era of my high school era when I was I was longing after this. Talk about a, 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 a relationship that was doomed. I'm going to tell you about a doomed relationship on our next episode. But I hope everybody enjoyed these tales of Cranford, New Jersey, C.C. Harris, <laughs> Roll Lapola, and the great Joe Aarons. Yeah. We hope Joe is uh, doing well. We hope he's thawed out yeah. <laughs> since 1974. But thank you so much for joining us for episode four of season two. We look forward to you telling the tale of Carrie's failed relationship. Yeah. I don't even know how uh, 
doomed relationship was a better framing. Yeah, when you hear about it, you'll 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 agree right out of the bat it was doomed. Oh uh, well, Carrie, thank you so much for your time tonight. We hope you all enjoyed it. Please rate, review, subscribe on iTunes, and uh, check Carrie out in the upcoming Ring of Honor Fantasy Draft on Ring of Honor's YouTube page. You are the commissioner, Carrie. Yes, yes, <laughs> I'll be wielding an angry hammer. <laughs> and uh, I'm looking for what is it? It's you, Bobby, Todd, and Caprice. And Caprice call yeah, me. beautiful. It's a wonderful group, and you got to keep Bobby Cruz in line. I'm not saying that I won't try and pull. I'm used to one, that, but, <laughs> but that's a tough job. Yeah, yeah, you got to keep the four of us in that line. That is a tough job. So that's going to be fun. It will be. We'll be uh, selecting 25 men, uh, six women, and I believe uh, six tag teams. To build out our uh, ideal Ring of Honor roster of all time, of all time, and I got I got somebody in my mind. I think you and I would agree who would go number one, but I don't want to I don't want to blow my spot here. I know who I would. I, I've uh, yeah, see, it's it's tougher than you might think, right? Well, I've got two. We'll talk about it next week. We'll talk about it next week, and fans, uh, let us know who you would take in the all time Ring of Honor yeah. fantasy draft. Who would you take number one? Would it be uh, a guy like Samoa Joe? Maybe Brian Danielson? How about Jay Lethal? Or even, it's hard to think of them separately, but one of the Briscoes. Oh, yeah. Or Adam Cole. Yeah. Or uh, Nigel. Right. Yeah. Or Matt Taven. <laughs> yeah, Matt Taven. I mean, there's only been two men that have won the Grand Slam. Matt Taven's one of them. He completed it at Madison Square Garden. It's hard to argue against that. Right. So, man, that's going to be a fun one. I'm looking forward to doing that with uh, with y'all. And uh, maybe, uh, maybe uh, I mean, I'm, is a guy like Kenta included? He is. Yeah. See, so there, it's quite very a bit in Ring of Honor. Yeah, absolutely. And then the, there's going to be steals. I feel like too. I mean, folks forget the Hardys. You know, the Hardys were former right. tag team champions. I think they might slip through the cracks. I don't want to give away too much of my strategy in case. Well, I know Todd listens. Uh, in case Bobby or Caprice are listening right now, I don't want to don't want to spoil too much right. of my strategy. But who would you take in the all time Ring of Honor draft? Let us know in the on Twitter, and uh, we'll see you next week for Carrie. I'm Ian. Happy wrestling, everybody. We'll, we'll talk to you then. We hail you for listening to Last Stop Penn Station podcast. Rate, review, like, subscribe, and share on your favorite platform. Connect with us on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter, or at laststoppennstation.com.